Hello, church, and welcome to our virtual worship service for Sunday, November 1st, 2020. Today was the second Sunday where we were able to meet in the church parking lot for our live worship services. So that will be the bulk of today's recording. But I come to you uh, for this initial portion of a couple announcements and a time of prayer. First, the announcements. Um, we will be doing this this Christmas something called the Christmas Miracle Program. It's a bit of a replacement for our Angel Tree Program, and it's in response to uh, COVID and these difficult times. So instead of doing gifts for families, where it's it's the focus is on gift cards provided for families in need. And so if you're interested in in providing for this uh, on Saturday, November seventh from 10 a.m. to 12 noon in the church parking lot, you can do a drive-through drop-off. So that means you could bring a, a check made out to the church, but in the, uh, in the memo line, maybe you just write uh, Christmas miracle. Don't maybe write that, do write Christmas miracle. And then um, whatever amount, and then someone from the Board of Community Ministries will use that to buy a gift card. Or you could buy gift cards yourself, say at Walmart or Target or Michaels or Kohl's, those kind of uh, places. And the increments are say $20 to $50 per card. And once you do that, then you can drop them off either on that, that Saturday, the 7th of November, or you can drop them off at the church office in an envelope. Uh, there's lots of ways to do it. The only stipulation really is that by November 14th, all donations need to be received. So please do contact the church office um, if you have any more questions about that. And then second, we will be doing our annual Salvation Army Church bell ringing. This church is has a long tradition of that. In fact, we will be using the Tom Barger Memorial Bell uh, for those efforts. And our week this year is December 7th to the 11th. And it's a Monday through Friday. It's from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. And generally it's two hour shifts, but the five to six p.m., the, the last shift is only a one hour shift, the five to six uh, time slot. So uh, please do sign up. If you, if you want to get in touch with the church office, more details can be provided or else if you'd, uh, if you receive the weekend update from last week, then you'll have some of this information in there already. Alternatively, you can call Susan Moore and she's happy to give you more information. So now, uh, please let's be together in the spirit of prayer. I want to lift up the prayers uh, that were shared, a couple of the prayers shared this morning from our church service. One for uh, our nation and for our, our citizens and our leaders in this nation, that um, wisdom and, and, and all of those things that, that, that bind us and hold us together, the fabric of this nation, may remain strong in these coming days and weeks as an election is, is always a time that's fraught with a lot of different um, attitudes and opinions and feelings. And we pray that the fabric uh, that keeps us strong as a nation will remain so, remain strong. I also want to lift up um, Sonda Sandstedt, one of our church members who recently received a difficult diagnosis. There's, there's a great reason for hope and, and recovery, but uh, at this time she's in the assessment phase of how to proceed. So uh, Sonda, we hold you in prayer. May you know the peace and the strength of Christ as you face these difficult initial days. I also want to hold up in prayer uh, all of those who have died this year. Today is All Saints Days. All Saints Day, and it's a day customarily where in churches we remember those who have died this past year. Well, in particular this year, I want to honor those who have died in this country uh, as a result of COVID-19. So would you please join me uh, for a time of silence? We're going to be silent for 23 seconds, each second representing uh, 10,000 lives lost in this country. Please be with me in that prayer. Thank you. 
And now, friends, would you please join me in saying those words that we say each week as a collective. And this week, may we say them with a courage and a strength that help that might help us to, to better live into these wonderful words. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So now I'd just like to invite us into a space of silence for a moment as I invite Carol Whiteson to come forward to kind of begin this service in a spirit of prayer. Let the truth shine in our speaking as the sun in fields by day, as the pure and slantless streaming of the noon's revealing ray, washing earth in heaven's brightness with the light from straight above, then we shall be faithful neighbors linked by Christ's deceitless love. When we wound or grieve each other, let us name the wrong that's done, never bearing hurt and anger past the setting of the sun. For our sin is in our silence, in the storm that never comes, or that afterward still lingers, sounding yet its grumbling drums. As the vesperal light is falling and the air is cooling down, as we smell the pines and cedars and the breathings of the ground, let Christ's richer mystic fragrance rise from our hearts today redeemed when we spoke the truth as neighbors while the sunlight brightly streamed. Please refer in, on your song sheet to an old favorite. It's called Let There Be Peace on Earth. For our scripture reading today, I'd like to invite my son Wyatt to come forward. I've got the reading for you, Wyatt. (laughs) 
Well, okay. A reading from Mark chapter 13, verses 1 to 8. As he walked away, as he walked away from the temple, one of his disciples said, Teacher, look at that stonework, those buildings. Jesus said, You're impressed by this grandiose architecture? There is not a stone in the whole works that is going to end that is not going to end up in a heap of rubble. Later, as he was sitting on Mount Olives in full view of the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew got him off by himself and asked, Tell us, when is this going to happen? What sign will we get that things are coming to a head? Jesus began, Watch out for doomsday deceivers. Many leaders are going to show up with forged identities claiming I'm the one. They will deceive a lot of people. When you hear the wars and, rum and rumored wars, keep your head and don't panic. This is routine history and no sign of the end. Nation will fight nation and ruler will fight ruler over and over. Earth earthquakes will conquer various places. There will be there will be famine. There will be famines, but these things are nothing compared to what's coming. Thank you, Spirit of prayer. <laughs> We're going to go with this, folks. God, you teach us that through all times, all circumstances, you are here and it is enough. So when we are tested, help us to remember that. And somehow may your spirit and your truth and your word and your way shine through, even when things may not be perfect. In the spirit and light of your son, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so if you ever have gone to modern Jerusalem and you sat on a hillside overlooking the city, you would see this, this amazing spectacle of this beautiful structure. Now, it's called the Dome of the Rock. And really, the Dome of the Rock now is a Muslim mosque that sits exactly where uh, Herod's temple originally sat on that hill. And when you look at it in a modern vantage point, I mean, you could just see pictures. Go online and check out the pictures if you haven't ever been there. But when you see it, it is just so striking, so impressive. And it doesn't take much to appreciate how it really would have looked back in the time of Jesus. I mean, you want to subtract about 80% of the buildings, obviously all the lights, all the cars, all that stuff. And it would just stand out even more. But it was such an, an impressive building. And Josephus, the Jewish historian, wrote about it, said, it is just this beautiful structure of marble, white polished marble and gold domed tops. Just one of the most beautiful buildings in the ancient Near East, the original temple, at least Herod's temple. And even if you haven't ever been there, it's just not hard to imagine what it would have looked like. And I imagine we would have wanted to sort of speak, maybe in the same way as the disciples did, uh, when, they were, when they were looking at it with Jesus initially. 
And they're sort of pointing out to him and saying, look, look, Lord, what, what huge stones those are there. Those are, those are impressive, aren't they? And, and they're sort of turning to Jesus in this moment. And it's like they're asking him, sort of saying, hey, you know, that impressive building over there, that's a, that's a sign, right? That even when things are a little tough, that it's going to be okay in the end, right? Right, Jesus? Well, what he says to them famously is, actually, there won't be a stone remaining in this beautiful structure before you. Every one of them will be thrown down. Now, from the time when Jesus walked this this earth, roughly around the ministry time, so say 30, the year 30, to about the time, a little after, when Mark's gospel was written, around the year 65 to 70, Israel was in a constant state of threat. As Mark puts it, there was uh, war and rumors of war all over the place. And, and during Mark's time, there were actually signs that there was going to be a rebellion, that Israel was going to rise up and try to cast out Rome from Jerusalem. Okay, and so while this is happening, this is kind of, um, you know, bubbling up, there's a lot of writings, these apocalyptic writings that are happening around the time of Mark. And so things were dicey politically. But then when people looked out on that hill and they saw that bulwark, that beautiful temple monument, they would think to themselves, ah, things could be falling apart, but at least we still have that. That's a sign that we are still favored. We are still strong. We are still here, and God is here with us. Right, Jesus? And what does Jesus say? He essentially says, no. No. Later that day, they go up on the hillside. They go down through the Kidron Valley and up to the Mount of Olives, and and they're looking at it again. And this is where the disciples are like, well, is this the end of the world? Is, is this the, the time when things are just going to keep falling apart, Jesus? You know, what's going on? Can, can you give us a sign? Can you give us any hope? And that's when Jesus does this. He replies, and, and this whole chapter 13 of Mark is, is this, it's often called the little apocalypse. That's what the scholars call it. And it's this language that we might associate with the book of Revelation, this sort of flowery, cosmic, kind of like, whoa, what's going on? It's like big language, a lot of imagery. And if, if you or I were there, you might listen to Jesus talking like that and say, okay, okay, hold it, stop, stop right there. Can you just give it to us straight? Can you just tell us, okay, what's going to happen and how, what do we do? How do we react? Okay, that's sort of what it can feel like to us as moderns. And, and the whole point of this reading is that a lot of times when we read these stories, we, we think, oh, well, that's just like, that's ancient stories, or that's sort of theoretical stuff that had to do with the Bible times. But the truth is, it wasn't just theoretical. This is real stuff. And if you know the context for Mark's gospel, you know that it was written and distributed right around the time when that rebellion I referred to did happen. And what happened as a result of that rebellion? A siege of Jerusalem and ultimately the complete destruction of that very temple. So no longer was it white marble and beautiful gold dome. No, now it was a, a trash heap. It's a pile of rubble. And so these questions were really uh, important. You know, in Mark's day, they're like, what is this... Is what's going on in our world? Is this the end? Has, have, have you forgotten us, God? Can, can you show us any sign of hope? You see, we're not the only ones to ask these kind of questions in our modern age, are we? And you know, in antiquity, I want to say one more little thing as sort of like backdrop to this, uh, this, this reading today. You hear that phrase, rumors of war, and we think, okay, yeah, just sort of rumors. Well, in that day, think about it. If, if there was a war that started a couple countries over in Greece, it would take a certain amount of time to get around the Mediterranean and finally reach its way to Jerusalem, where you'd maybe hear a report. But then in the weeks or months that that would take, there were all sorts of other reports and, and comments about, well, what else is happening and what's this person doing and, and these rumors and other ideas and details that were filling in and didn't necessarily give them a full sense of the truth. They had a hard time actually discerning what was the real story. And 2,000 years later, it doesn't take us months to get our news. We get it instantaneously with the internet, but... I think a lot of us would agree that we are not necessarily sure that the information we know is true either. 
Well, Mark's audience is, is in touch with that, that emotion. They know something's wrong. And they're wondering what the heck's going on. And so this apocalyptic language is really important. It's very powerful to them. And Jesus, what he's saying is, look, you might hear about wars and rumors of war, all that stuff. You might hear about other people that say they're going to come. No matter what's happening, though, your job is to continue forward in your mission. Your job is to keep walking in the love and in the way and in the hope that I've showed you. It doesn't change. And what's really a powerful thing, it didn't come through in the message, uh, the version that Wyatt read, but in, in the NRSV, at the end of this part, Jesus says, for this is but the beginning of the birth pangs. It's about the beginning of the birth pangs. What's he talking about? That this whole thing is not this devastating end, but it's something new that's about to be born. And yeah, it hurts now, and it's scary now, and we're not sure now, but something new is coming. That's what Jesus is talking about here. And then to make himself very clear, later on in chapter 13, Jesus says to his disciples, and of course, that's to us later on, too, as we read this, no one knows the hour of God's coming, neither the angels nor the Son. No one knows, okay? Hear that. No one knows. And it makes me think of the cottage industry we've had for years now, of all of those books, the Left Behind series that try to tell us about when the apocalypse is going to happen or the end of the world. Remember in 1970s that book called The Late Great Planet Earth? All of these ways that, that, that people think we're going to find the code and we're going to predict it and we're going to figure it out. If they just understood this little verse. We've had doomsday cults like Jonestown and uh, Heaven's Gate and and, uh, and the Branch Davidians and so many others that seem to think that they can find this secret and present the code. And yet what Jesus is saying is nobody knows. And so stop worrying about that. Stop trying to predict that. Stop spending all your energy in the fear and in the doomsday prepping. And keep living the mission that I've given you. Amen. Don't stop. Amen. Their job is to keep moving because he's talking about birth pangs, right? Birth pangs are sign of new life to come, not the sign of everything falling off a cliff. Now, I know it can feel like things are falling off a cliff. They know that, too, in this story. Our job's to move forward, though, in faith and hope. But let's be honest with each other. We try to be honest every week. We all know that under the best circumstances in our lives, best circumstances, it's hard to walk today with a lot of faith and hope. Okay? Just in the best circumstances. Now, you start, you start throwing changes in there, changes in our lives, and all bets are off. And I don't care if it's, uh, well, negative changes are obviously challenging to walk through, but even positive changes can leave us asking all sorts of questions. They can leave us sorrowful. They can leave us wondering. I mean, heck, it was almost nine years ago to this week that I flew out here with Andrea. So we hadn't even had our boys yet, Why it was to be born in January, we came out here and it was my candidating weekend. And so we're, we're out here and we're starting to, you know, as it's becoming clearer that this looks like it's gonna be the place that we're gonna call home. We were excited because you start looking around, you see Auburn, this is not just a place now that we're visiting, this is home, this is where roots are gonna be. That was exciting. But it also left me feeling, maybe for the first time, that real sense of longing and sadness you know, I was leaving family and friends back in New England. That's I'd lived most of my life there. Birthdays and holidays would be different now. Getting lobster as often and as cheaply would be really hard. Finding a coffee as good as Dunkin' Donuts to satisfy me would be... Well, actually, that wasn't much of a challenge to replace that, but... You get what I'm saying. Every change, the good ones, they leave us with a lot of questions and we can be rolling through some challenges and some sorrow. Because whenever we begin something new, how often, it's always the case almost, that something else has had to die. Something else has, has ended. But what did Jesus say? This is the beginning of those birth pangs. In the meantime, continue to keep doing what you are called to do, who you are. Even when it feels like the end of the world's coming, 
Jesus is saying to his disciples, we've got a mission, we've got a message. You stay on that. You get out there and keep bringing the message. You know, each, each year I meet with uh, Scott Bond uh, to talk about our stewardship theme and, and try to figure out ways to, to communicate the message, to, to encourage and inspire people. And, you know, it's been challenging with COVID when we've been apart. You know, how, do, how does the church feel vital and relevant? Well, I think we somehow managed to, to, to find that way. It's not perfect. It's always better to be back together like this. But I remember sitting initially with Scott and, you know, we were talking about the challenges of this year in particular. And if you know Scott, he's a pretty enthusiastic guy. You know, he's kind of, it's, it's hard not to get caught up in it when he gets going. And he was sort of sharing with me this, this whole idea. It's like, you know, I don't care about the fact that we're in a pandemic. This church is an amazing church with a powerful message. We're inclusive. We're welcoming of all people. And this is when people need to know we're still here. We're still open and welcoming. Not, this isn't canceled. So we got to get people up here. And when he was sitting there, I was like, yeah, preach it, Scott. No, no longer are you going to be able to beg off when I ask you to preach there, buddy. But, <laughs> But he was preaching it, and, and as I was reading this scripture, now you can't tell him this, okay, don't tell this. But what Scott was talking about when we were meeting, it sounded like Jesus. I'm sorry, Sheila. <laughs> well, if you knew, Scott did play Jesus in our Living Last Supper a few years ago. <laughs> but look, the point is, we do have a message that needs to be shared, that this inclusive welcome of all people, no matter what your background, your beliefs, your sexuality, your race, your creed, come as you are. Be here, be fully yourself, and be loved, and then go out and share that love. That is a message that is not explicitly or implicitly the same across all Christian churches. That is a powerful message here. So that's the message. You know, that we didn't invent that. That's part of you know, something that has been handed to us that we, we hand on. And so even then, when, when things feel like they're falling apart, when it feels kind of end of the worldish, when things are crazy and strange and we don't really know where our bearings are, that is what we do. That's the mission that's before us. And that should remain our focus. All right, have any of you ever heard of a man named Abraham Davenport? Yeah, I hadn't either. Don't worry about that. <laughs> But it's really cool. I love this story. He's a, he was a representative in the 1700s back in Connecticut. And during his time in office, there was an event in New England that came to be called the Dark Day. Now, it was more than one day. And it was this time where it was whether it was uh, smoke or storms, but there was this deep, dark fog that enveloped the whole area where, where you couldn't see at noon. There was no sun, and it was just, it, people had to have candles just to find their way in the middle of the day. And so it got so uh, to the point where, you know, as the state legislature was meeting in this period, there, there came a motion to say, you know what, let's, let's call this off. Let's stop, you know, we don't need to meet as a legislature. We got to go home uh, because people were worried that the world was ending. Now, if they'd been in California in the last few years, they'd say, well, that just, that's called fire season. But that day, that's not the perspective that they had. They were worried that the world was ending. They said, we got to get out of you know, our legislature to go home and hunker down. This guy, Andrew Davenport, he gets up in the face of that and he says, no, I would counter that adjournment. And he went on to say, if it's not the end of the world, then we have nothing to worry about. If it is the end of the world, I want to be found doing my duty. Bring out more candles. And I just love that. <laughs> I think that is so appropriate for what's going on today in our world and in our lives. Be it in regards to fire season or the election in two days or the pandemic or the message of our church. If our lights go out now, that doesn't stop us. If the other candidate wins, it doesn't stop us. If the virus forces us to meet virtually again, it does not stop us. If the world seems dark and smoky, that's fine. Bring out more candles. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>
Yet many of us, we know that the worries and the fear, they arise in the days of the smoke and the fog and the darkness. It's natural. It's how it's always been. You know, most of us aren't afraid to get on a plane until it starts getting turbulent, okay? And, and when that turbulence happens in our lives, we don't like it. But here's another thing we know. When do we tend to grow? When do we tend to change in our lives? When stuff gets turned upside down. It's oftentimes when that new change, that new birth starts to happen. And sometimes we need to have things turned upside down so we can start seeing them right side up. We get a new little, a new perspective on our lives and our place in this world. Kathleen Norris is a great author and she tells a story of a young friend of hers, a brilliant scholar and university professor. And this friend was stricken with cancer. Cancer came in and she spent years treating it and living with it and moving with it. And, and three times she seemed to be at death's door. But each time she managed to pull through. Finally, after many years, the cancer went into remission. And later that young friend said to Norris, you know what? I don't ever wanna go back to those days before my cancer diagnosis. Because right now, I live and I love every single day like the gift that it is. I would never go back. Norris went on to say to her, you know, well, we've had a lot of years of struggle though, haven't we? And her friend said, yes. And isn't that a blessing? Now, is she saying cancer is a blessing? No, no. But the struggle that enabled her to live and the willingness to live today is a blessing. And even if you've only got one day left, it is still a blessing. You know, two days from now, we all know, our country will participate in one of the most important acts that we have as citizens. Heck, most of us have already participated in it. And in the coming days and weeks, some will feel one way about the outcome and others will feel another way. The days ahead will likely be challenging no matter what the outcome of the election is. But after that's settled, and no matter how you feel about how it was settled, will you join me in asking this simple question? It's a question you don't have to ask out loud. You can just sort of in the private of your own space and time just ask this. It's the question, God, what's next? In my life, in my role, in my relationships, in my work, what's next now, God? Because even when we're in terrible turmoil, maybe especially when everything seems upside down, That's when we need to ask God, what's next? Because something is. May each one of us stay focused on the work that is before us. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to set up uh, for this next song here. delicate. I'll try not to touch the cables. We're going to do a song here for our uh, anthem. It's a beautiful song. It's by an artist named Rue Paines and it's called Ophelia and he wrote this song from what I gathered in homage to that famous character Ophelia that was in Greek tragedies for for generations, but also appeared in, in Shakespeare's Hamlet. She's a, she's a symbol of, of long aching hope. And in her case, um, the hope didn't win out for Ophelia. But this song speaks to his longing. And I think some of the message of what I was trying to say today, that when the world seems dark, that's when, when it needs our love and our hope. And there is still possibility for so much life. So we offer this song to you in that spirit.
sapling soul in a sea of fire. Oh, I was afraid for my Ophelia. But take heart, my love, cause when I see you, I see hope. When I see you, I see hope. There's a world that needs what you got to give. Take heart, my love, cause when I see you, I see hope. When I see you, I see home. There's a world that needs what you got to give. That's it. <laughs> when people see you today, tomorrow, this week, let them see hope. Let them see life and love. And this world's dark. Feels like it's falling apart, smoky, stormy. You know what to do. Get more candles. Let's sing our uh, closing song, our song of sending on the back of your song sheet. Blessed be the tie that binds. Christ. Amen. Amen. Take heart, my love. 
Yeah. 